The only living witness um, continued. Uh, prologue continued, and then moving to chapter one. Um, <clears throat> the last recording uh, I ended in the, with in the paragraph. This was a recurring sore point among us. Ted's wife lived on the edge of poverty in Gainesville, from where she and her teenage son Jamie drove to the prison each weekend to visit husband and stepfather. Bundy nagged at us constantly to stay in touch with Carol and to keep her informed of our progress. Well, Boone could be a good company. She had a very quick wit. Bundy was creating a difficult situation. <clears throat> Carol, who was sustained by her faith in Ted's innocence, didn't know the content of our discussion. She did know that Hugh and I believed Ted was guilty, which could make our meetings uncomfortable. Carol thought us to be contemptible fools, no better in her view than the police and prosecutors who had put her beloved bunny on death row. As it happened that day, I had a two-day-old note to Ted from Carol, which I handed over. He glanced at it, smiled briefly, and inquired as to my health. Consigned to his last address with three death penalties over his head, Bundy nevertheless concerned himself with what he regarded as my poor diet and drinking habits. We once wagered which of us would expire first. Ted owes me $50. I allowed that I was fine, all, thing cons all things considered, and the three of us settled into a desultory chat that ranged from Ronald Reagan's presidential campaign to uh, <clears throat> Ted's concerns over the moral climate in which his stepson Jamie was being raised. In this way, we chewed up the allotted two hour, the hour, two allotted hours, and then rose to leave. Ted was now Hugh's responsibility. I had a head full of impressions to sort out and scores of tapes to transcribe before I could start sketching this difficult saga. I did take one last look at Ted's hands as we departed. They were thin, almost delicate, with slender, tapering fingers and well-kept nails. Ted had recently broken himself of the habit of biting them. I wondered again at the frightening strength it had taken to bind ligatures so tightly that the rope and victim's skin fused together. Where in Ted was the power behind those enormously damaging wax of his oak club? He had introduced the entity to us, tried to explain it, and then would finally collapse and bring the seas or better be transformed under the pressure of confronting himself. But he would never be able to take Hugh and me that final step to comprehension of murder so grotesque as to defy imagination. We could never know the hunchback, and both of us liked to think the limitation was ours. I heard all about it again and again and again as I transcribed those prison tapes. <clears throat> In time, we could retell it, we could give it context, but we could not get our minds around it. It was like the taste of bouillabaisse. Chapter 1. <clears throat> Washington State is separated into two distinct and dissimilar zones by a spine of rugged mountains, the dramatic volcanic Cascade Range. East of the high divide lie dry, undulating farmlands and expanses of near desert where the summers are hot and the winters often severe. In the lower elevations west of the Cascades, the climate is milder and considerably wetter. The soil tends to be highly acidic. There is pervasive dampness and an abundance of wildlife. In these conditions, an exposed corpse rapidly will vanish. The dominant colors of western Washington are green, blue, white, and gray. There is the green of the vast timber forests and national parks, the blue of the lakes and the saltwater inlets, scraped out eons ago by monumental glaciers. White covers many of the higher mountain peaks the year around, and the sky generally is an oppressive gray from the frequent northern Pacific weather systems that slash ashore on the Olympic Peninsula, then are gentled as they move inland to the barrier of the Cascades. The sun does not shine too often in western Washington. Despite the chills and mists and inky mornings and evenings that in winter nearly link with <clears throat> one another around one o'clock in the afternoon, Washingtonians are relentlessly outdoorsy. Practically everyone, it seems, has a boat or a camper or a ski cabin or lake property or drives one of those wheeled behemoths called RVs, recreational vehicles. 
Bird, deer, and bear hunting is popular in the state, so is fishing. Even Washington's urban population clustered mainly in and around the Seattle area where Boeing and Microsoft are major industrial presences is robust, overwhelmingly white, and oriented toward the natural world beyond the city limits. To the native, western Washington has always been God's country. A semi-isolated temperate zone entire unto itself where the confusion and din and extremes of the outside world have yet to intrude. It seems so safe and clean. They say it is a good place to raise a family. That is what James and Joyce Healy would have said before the 1st of February 1974. They lived in a comfortable suburb, resplendent with fir trees, just east of Seattle. James worked for a cash register company. Joyce was a housewife. They had three happy, well-adjusted children, a teenage son, Robert, and daughter, Laura, and 21-year-old Linda. Linda Healy was an accomplished singer and extrovert and her mother's favorite. She had a sweet voice, wide-set blue eyes, shoulder-length brown hair, and an even smile that conveyed poise and self-assurance. She was willowy and full of life, a senior psychology major at the University of Washington who looked forward to being a teacher. Linda enjoyed working with children. The previous autumn, she and four other girls had moved from their dorm rooms into a green two-story frame house in Seattle's University District. Linda had her own basement bedroom with the window. On the other side of a thin plywood partition was another bedroom. She worked as a ski report announcer for a local radio station. To thousands of area skiers, she was the dulcet Linda. No last names were given over the air. Who purred over the airwaves that Paradise Valley was open, <clears throat> that Crystal Mountain had seven inches of new powder, that there would be night skiing at Alpenthal. Each morning before school, she awoke and paddled down to the radio station on her bike. It was a short trip through the pitch black pre-dawn of the Seattle winter. Often it was raining and rarely would there be, would there yet be many people stirring in the university district. In very few American cities would a young woman take such risks, but Linda Healy evidently felt no fear at being alone and vulnerable in the university district where she'd lived for almost four years. She appears not to have been aware that in early January of 1974, a young woman had been attacked very near to where she lived. <clears throat> like Linda, <clears throat> Mary Adams, a pseudonym, had a basement, window, bedroom, and a house she shared with several other people. <clears throat> she had been sound asleep when a man assaulted her in her bed. He took a heavy metal rod to her head, thrashing at her repeatedly. A speculum or vaginal probe of the type commonly available <clears throat> from medical supply houses had been thrust brutally up inside her, a kind of bloody, frenzied, quote-unquote, examination that caused extensive internal injuries. Mary Adams survived after spending several months in a coma. She remembered nothing of the attack or her attacker. On Thursday night, January 31st, 1974, Linda Healy cooked a casserole supper for her roommates. Afterwards, she accompanied one of the girls and a young man of their mutual acquaintance for a couple hours of casual beer drinking at Dante's, a nearby college bar. She was home by 9 p.m. and in bed by 11, having set her alarm, as always, for 5.30. Perhaps an hour later, the girl who slept in the makeshift bedroom next to Linda's came downstairs and went to bed herself. <clears throat> this housemate, a light sleeper, heard nothing then or through the night until Linda's alarm went off in the morning and kept ringing. Then the manager of the radio station called. Where was Linda? She hadn't come to work. A quick check revealed she was nowhere in the house, yet her bicycle had not been moved. Linda's roommates were immediately apprehensive. As Friday wore on and there still was no sign of her, her cares escalated to fear. Around 4 o'clock that afternoon, Joyce Healy called the house. She and the rest of the Healy family were expected over for dinner that night. 
We haven't seen Linda all day, one of her frightened roommates blurted into the telephone. <clears throat> As she burst into tears, Joyce Healy felt ice on her spine. Immediately, she told us, I knew there was something extremely wrong. I called the police right away. She and her husband, Jim, met the officers at Linda's house. All the girls were gathered in the living room, and none of them would leave the room unaccompanied. The officers were courteous, businesslike, and plainly skeptical of the possibility of foul play. Cases such as this were more or less routine for them. Implicit in their questions was the belief that this mysterious disappearance was no mystery at all. Linda would show up at her boyfriend's or call to say she'd be right home, but Joyce Healy knew better. She quietly explained to the police that <clears throat> um, Linda wouldn't do that sort of thing. Not her, Linda. Well, <clears throat> the one of the officers told her that's the kind that do it and the ones you don't expect. Linda's basement room was inspected. A small blood stain was found on her pillow and bottom sheet. It was a positive blood, Linda's type, as was another caked red blotch discovered on her nightgown, which neatly hung in her closet. The official conclusion, Linda Healy had suffered a late night nosebleed and had gone somewhere to have it attended to. Someone should check the local hospitals. Her red knapsack and a change of clothes were gone, suggesting that she had left the house on her own. But missing, too, was Linda's top bed sheet and a decorative red satin pillowcase. Also, her bed was made with distinctive hospital corners, which would have required pulling it away from the wall and then pushing it back into place. Why, the police might have wondered, would a young woman who rarely made her bed under any circumstances take time to do so in a medical emergency? Why remove the top sheet? Why would she take the pillowcase? Yet, what would later become the most probable theory of the case at first would have seemed ludicrous. How could someone in the dead of night enter the house, creep downstairs, overpower Linda, wrap her in a sheet, and then carry her inert 5'7", 115 pound body back up the stairs and out the door without being heard? Such a suspect would also have carefully made her bed, hung up her nightgown, selected the change of clothes, and taken her knapsack. Dismissing this possibility as far-fetched, the police did not dust the room for fingerprints or process of her telltale hair or fiber evidence, or even test a semen stain found on her sheet. For the next several months, the Seattle police learned nothing more. Even after they understood that this was not a middle-of-the-night nosebleed, that someone, in fact, had abducted Linda, it was several more months before they thought to compare <clears throat> the healing <clears throat> disappearance with the nearby attack on Mary Adams. Certainly, it was premature to advance the possibility that a homicidal night stalker, who is perhaps familiar with hospitals, the distinctive bed corners and medical supplies, the speculum, was roving in the dark through the university district hunting. The Seattle Times and the Seattle Post Intelligencer ran several early stories on Linda Healy's disappearance, but their coverage fell off as the police inquiry foundered. Then, answers sought to Coed's disappearance greeted readers of the Times' March 29th editions nearly two months after Linda Healy had vanished. The story reported that on March 12th, Donna Gail Manson, 19, had disappeared 60 miles south of Seattle on the campus of Evergreen State College in Olympia, the state capital. She was last seen at about 7 p.m. as she left her dorm to attend an on-campus jazz concert. Donna Manson was a little moonstruck, a sharp contrast to the sunny and purposeful Lyndall Healy. She was musical like Linda. Donna played the flute. But she also dabbled in the occult, wrote syrupy poetry, and was fascinated by the medieval alchemists. School appears to have bored her, just as Western Washington's near-ceaseless rains frequently depressed her. 
She wasn't reported missing for five days. Donna's acquaintances knew that a chance encounter with a new friend wasn't out of the question for her, nor would they be surprised if she decided to thumb a ride somewhere on a moment's whim. Donna had done so before. A few months earlier, she had hitchhiked south to Oregon for a few days, not bothering to tell anyone exactly where she was headed, if she knew, or how long she'd be gone. Now she was gone for good. Once notified that Donna was missing, the police considered the possibility of suicide. She was known to be moody, but when no suicide note or body was found and she did not return to campus, they concluded that Donna Manson had been kidnapped. How it had happened was anyone's guess. She had walked out in a misty, gloomy night, wrapped against the cold in her grandmother's full-length coat, a treasured possession. Her route through the heavily forested campus would have taken her down pathways, affording ample opportunities for someone to jump out and silence her. The police believe it happened otherwise. They knew that Donna Manson almost certainly was taken from the campus, probably by car. The only logical place for her abductor to have parked was behind the auditorium where the jazz concert was held. There were too many students out that night for someone not to have noticed someone carrying a lifeless body around, so Donna must have willingly accompanied her killer to his car. When it happened, either before, during, or after the concert is unknown, and most details of what happened to Donna Manson remain a mystery as well. The Healy and Manson cases resembled one another only insofar as both victims were white college girls and there was not a single substantive clue to either's fate. The dissimilarities were more striking. The two did not resemble one another. Linda was tall and outgoing. Donna was just five feet tall, weighed less than 100 pounds, and was withdrawn. The incidents occurred 60 miles apart in two different police jurisdictions and were separated by 40 days. One girl vanished from her bed. The second was last seen, alert and afoot. Donna Manson's disappearance received even less press attention than did Linda Healy's. So far, not even the tiniest ripple of apprehension had stirred the people of Western Washington. The next attack came at Central Washington State College, CWSC, in rural Ellensburg, about 120 miles east of Seattle. Set down amidst the rolling eastern foothills of the Cascades, Ellensburg is close to ski areas and physically remote from the major population centers of Western Washington. For much of the year, it is reached from the west by road only via the formidable 3,010-foot-high Snoqualmie Pass on US-90. Just before 9 on Sunday night, April 14, 1974, 21-year-old Jane Curtis finished her work in the CWSC library and walked out the main entrance. There, she encountered a shabby figure struggling with some books. He was wearing a long coat and a wool cap pulled low over his head. His left arm was in a gauze <clears throat> cast, in parentheses, no sling, close parentheses, and Curtis noticed his fingers were sheathed in a metal splint. The splint apparatus looked sloppily done to her as if it had been applied with one hand or was just taped on. The young woman, nevertheless, volunteered to help the man with his books. He gratefully accepted her offer and they set out across campus for his car. Later, Curtis was certain that the stranger could not have been taller than 5'8 or so because she stood 5'9 in her platform shoes and he definitely seemed shorter than he, she was. She further remembered to the police, he kind of looked at me sideways, kind of turned his head and looked at me funny like his I seem weird. As they neared his car parked in the tall grass in a darkened area of the campus, he complained of the pain in his arm, which he said he had broken in a skiing accident. He said he had hit a tree. At the passenger side door, the man produced his key and asked Curtis if she'd unlock his car. Suddenly apprehensive, she refused. <clears throat> So he unlocked the vehicle himself. <clears throat> Months later, Jane Curtis would recollect under questioning that the car was a yellow Volkswagen bug with a high back front seat, which was black. The interior light did not go on as he opened the door, but she could see well enough to tell that the front passenger side seat was missing. Jane Curtis grew frightened. 
Brusquely, he ordered her into the car. What? she asked. Oh, his tone changed. Could you get in and start the car for me? With that, the young woman turned and fled. I sort of ran away, she told police kind of fast. Three days later, Kathleen Diolovo stepped out of the same library door Jane Curtis had used and was <clears throat> walking down the sidewalk when she heard a noise behind her. I turned around and there was this man dropping books, Diolovo would tell investigators. He was squatting, trying to pick up the books and some packages. I noticed he had a sling on one arm and a hand brace on the other. I went over and said, do you need some help? He said, yeah, could you? The man's facial features didn't register clearly with Kathleen. He was sloppily dressed, about six feet tall and kind of scrawny looking, quote unquote. His hair was light brown, kind of shaggy. She was unsure if he wore a mustache or glasses. Something told her that he had both. Miss Diolovo originally believed the man was headed for the library, but as she walked along with him, carrying most of his books, he turned toward a dark area where he said his car was parked. She grew suspicious, but figured she could whack him with one of her books if he tried anything. <clears throat> they arrived at his car, and he produced his keys. As he unlocked the passenger side door, he suddenly dropped them. After a moment of searching on his hands and knees, he stood up and asked Kathleen if she could help. His sling and hand brace, he explained, made it tough to feel around on the ground for small objects. On the way to his car, Kathleen Diolovo made sure to keep the man in her sight in front of her. Now, standing alone with him by the vehicle, which she described to police as a shiny brown Volkswagen bug, the young woman wasn't about to drop her guard. I didn't want to bend over in front of him, she reported, so I said, let's step back and see if we can see your reflection in the lights. I squatted down, and luckily I did see the reflection, so I picked the keys up and dropped them in his hand and said goodnight. <clears throat> Moments later, Susan Elaine Rancourt wouldn't be so fortunate. She was a freshman biology major, a blue-eyed, blonde-haired former cheerleader and high school homecoming queen, known for her wholesomeness. In parentheses, in her family, Susan was called Prudence Pureheart, close parentheses, and her sensible ways. Her father had paid for a lot of dental work, and Susan protected the investment by brushing and flossing her teeth religiously. She was a sturdy girl at 5 feet, 120 pounds. Susan was more serious-minded than most CWSC students. She thought she wanted to become a doctor, maybe a research scientist. Professions that would require hard work, discipline, and years of study. An A student, Rancourt had the drive and intelligence to make it, plus an engaging personal warmth and a concern for the well-being of others. The only thing that seemed to get in her way was her painful late adolescent shyness, and Susan was working on that too. The night of April 17, 1974, she had attended a meeting for prospective dorm counselors. Shortly after 10, about the time that Kathleen Diolovo found the Volkswagen keys in the gravel and handed them back to the man in the cast, Susan left the meeting and headed back across campus toward her dormitory. She was afraid of the dark and would have been walking gingerly since she had left her contact lenses in her room. Any sudden movement or suspicious sound would have frightened her, but a cripple in need, helplessly trying to manage his books, might not have. With her mind on the counselor's meeting, the German language film she wanted to see that night, and the load of laundry she'd left in the dormitory washing machine, Susan Rancourt likely was less alert to trouble than usual. What is more, her deter determination not to be so shy could have led her to a bit more boldness than was her custom. She did not see the movie that night. She did not pick up her laundry, and she did not return to her dorm room. The next afternoon, her roommate reported her missing to campus security officer Bill Clayton, who notified his chief, Alfred Pickles. Pickles ordered up a campus search, issued a flyer, parentheses, which neglected to mention the date of the missing girl's disappearance, close parentheses, and called Susan's parents in Anchorage, Alaska. 
The search and follow-up investigation appeared to have been perfunctory. They failed to turn up Jane Curtis and Kathleen Diolova, who were first interviewed many months later by a Seattle detective. Overall responsibility for the case inexplicably was delegated to Alfred Pickles' secretary. The Rancourts flew down from Anchorage immediately. If it were one of my other children, I'd just say stand by. They'll be back in two or three days, Dale Rancourt told the Seattle Times, but not Susan. She always was very careful. Mr. Rancourt told the reporter that his 18-year-old daughter would have packed a suitcase if she was going to go somewhere overnight and that she would have notified someone where she was going to be. That is just the kind of girl she is, he explained. Any doubts the family might have had about Susan's disappearance were settled when Mrs. Rancourt looked in her daughter's dorm room medicine cabinet and found her dental floss. Never, under any circumstances, would this sensible girl with a mouthful of expensive dental work leave without her floss. That was just the kind of girl she was. The Rancourts, like the Healy's and the Mansons before them, and many other families who would follow, endured the special agony of knowing and not knowing what had become of their child. As Joyce Healy remembered, quote, I went kind of crazy. All the time I thought, oh my gosh, she's probably dead. But we cannot quit, we cannot give up, we have to try, end quote. All three families posted rewards, hired private detectives, prayed and endured press interviews in the hopes of keeping their daughter's pictures in the papers. In this pre-America's Most Wanted era, the Rancourts tried and failed to get Susan's picture on national television. In all, the family's efforts to keep a spark of hope alive yielded little but the usual crank responses, the supposed sightings of the girls, the late night telephone calls from heavy breathers, and the scam artists offering to return their daughters for a price. As yet, however, no one thought the three families shared a common problem. Although in each case foul place was now considered probable, and in each case there were no good suspects, these were negative links, not the sort of positive connections police are trained to notice. Later, when the links were finally made, the police discovered that the girls were being murdered at the rate of at least one victim a month. So, Linda Healy was February's murder, Manson for March, Rancourt for April, but then there was no good candidate for May. In the cynical humor of people who have seen too much, the police would call their missing victim Miss May. Her full name was Roberta Kathleen Parks. On the night of May 6, 1974, Kathy Parks left her dormitory room at Oregon State University in Corvallis, 260 miles south of Seattle, and was last seen on her way to the Student Union Building. She was a stunning 21-year-old blonde who majored in religion. A sensitive girl who recovered slowly from emotional shocks, Kathy had just that week quarreled by phone <clears throat> with her father and then learned from her sister in Spokane that he had suffered a heart attack. Friends said Kathy was deeply depressed the day of her disappearance. Her moodiness led police at first to believe that Kathy Parks, like Donna Manson, might have killed herself. For a week after she was reported missing, they searched the vicinity for her body, even dragging a nearby river bottom. When they discovered nothing, a flyer was issued and sent to regional police agencies, just as similar data sheets and photos had been routinely issued for the three previous victims. It was all routine. An agency like the Seattle Police received notices of missing young women at about at the rate of about one per week in the mid-1970s. Since the cases usually were outside Seattle's jurisdiction, there rarely was a reason to pay much attention to them. The flyers were posted as they came in, one on top of the other. A case from 260 miles to the south in another state was even less likely to raise any interest. The next victim, the first of Miss of two Miss Junes, might not have died if she'd been sober. Unlike the other victims so far, Brenda Ball was not a student. At 22, she was also the oldest victim to date. Ball had spent much of the night of May 31, 1974, at the Flame Tavern in Burien, a working class town wedged between Seattle and SeaTac Airport to the south. The Flame was a tough, seedy joint set up on cinder blocks and known for the rough crowd that hung out there. 
Fistfights commonly broke out in the parking lot. Noise complaints were routine. Every month or two, the police would receive a missing person report listing the flame as the last place the person was seen. Around 2 a.m. on June 1st, closing time, Brenda Ball bid a beery adieu to her fellow patrons and walked out of the flame in search of a ride. She had talked earlier of hitching to a state park to meet some friends for the weekend. Brenda could take care of herself. She led an unstructured life open to adventure, and she was largely free of inhibitions. Not until June 17th was the King County Police Department notified by her friends that Brenda was missing, last seen at the flame. Meanwhile, the second Miss June vanished. On page one of the Seattle Times' is <clears throat> June 12th editions, under a photograph of Richard Nixon and Anwar Sadat waving to a crowd of cheering dusty Karenese, the little that was known of George Ann Hawkins was reported. <clears throat> UW Coed 18 disappears on way to sorority. Police were seeking information today about an 18 year old coed who disappeared early yesterday in the university district. Georgianne Hawkins of Lakewood near Tacoma last was seen after she left a friend's residence to return to the Kappa Alpha Theta sorority shortly after 1 a.m. yesterday. <clears throat> The friend said she left via an alley. She told them she was going back to the sorority to study for a final examination. Several acquaintances reported seeing and speaking with her as she walked back toward the sorority, but she never arrived and friends became concerned about 3 a.m. when she failed to show up for the final examination. Friends began telephoning friends and relatives, according to a sorority supervisor. George Ann is an absolutely stable and dependable girl, the supervisor said. It would not be like her to leave without telling her roommate or her friends. <clears throat> Toward the bottom of the article came the first tentative public suggestion that a serial killer was loose. Police said they were looking for any possible links, the reporter wrote, between the disappearance of Miss Hawkins and the January 31st disappearance of Linda Ann Healy, 21, also UW co-ed. George Ann Hawkins was a conventionally pretty girl with, a, with soft brown hair and an infectious beaming smile. She was almost exactly the same height and weight as Susan Rancourt. She also had poor eyesight. Hawkins also had been a cheerleader at Lake at Suburban Lakes High School just south of Tacoma. In her senior year, Georgia Ann won a popular popularity come beauty contest. She was voted her school's daffodil princess. In honor, an annual honor bestowed upon one girl each from several Tacoma area high schools who preside at the court of the local daffodil festival. With her selection also went George Ann's opportunity to ride with her sister royals aboard a float in the spring daffodil parade through <clears throat> downtown Tacoma. She was any man's idea of the sweet all-American girl. At the university, she was a B-plus student and somehow also found the time and opportunity to be quite tanned by finals week. The night of June 11th, Hawkins had gone to an end-of-term party where witnesses said she drank no more than three beers. Georgia Ann hadn't worn her contacts that night, nor did she bring along her keys. By prior arrangement, she was going to awaken her roommate by throwing pebbles against the windows of their room. After midnight, Hawkins walked part way home from the party with the girlfriend then stopped for about a half hour to chat with her boyfriend at the Beta Theta Pie house. She left by the fraternity's alley side exit and then stopped again for maybe five minutes to speak with another Beta brother whose upstairs window was open on this warmish June night. She then had less than 300 feet to walk down a brightly lit alley to her sorority house. At about the same hour, witnesses later recalled a tall man wearing what appeared to be a leg cast and stumbling along on crutches was seen in the vicinity. 
He had with him a briefcase, which he kept fumbling and dropping. Descriptions of the man later offered to the police were very similar to the reports, which came in later, of the stranger with his armload of books who approached Jane Curtis. And then Kathleen Diolivo, just before Susan Rancourt disappeared in Ellensburg, he had come full circle back to his home turf, Seattle's University District. As George Ann Hawkins walked along, she peered forward intently. Her vision without her lenses, as poor as Susan Rancourt's had been that night in April. Along the way, many students' windows were open onto the alley, and at least two groups of people saw the co-ed walking along the middle of the alley, where the streetlights shone the brightest. One witness, a fraternity house mother, reported that she heard a high, terrified scream that night, but no one else reported hearing or seeing anything. George Ann Hawkins's sleeping roommate didn't hear any sound at all from the darkened area <clears throat> below her window where George Ann was to have stopped and tossed pebbles at their window. Somewhere in the last 30 or 40 feet, feet of her walk, a space where the lamplight was much less intense, George Ann vanished. One instant she was there, alive, and then nothing. The next morning was Captain Herb Swindler's first day as the new head of the Seattle Police Homicide Squad. A balding, archetypically gruff cop with 30 years experience in everything from pounding a beat to busting narcotics traffickers, Swindler was no stranger to multiple homicide. He had worked as many as 18 different murder cases at one time. Out of the hundreds of homicides he's, he'd investigated over the years, only once he claimed did Swindler fail to identify the killer. This would be the second time. <clears throat> he looked over the preliminary report on George Ann Hawkins and shook his head in disbelief. Disbelief and recognition. Though assigned to another division throughout the preceding months, Herb Swindler had taken a professional interest in the several reports of missing girls around the region. He hadn't seen a pattern exactly, but he had noted the negative link the one factor that was consistent throughout each case. There was no evidence. Now confronted with the Hawkins' disappearance, Swindler pondered for a moment and then asked his sergeant for the homicide unit's files on the other missing girls, including Linda Ann Healy, who already was a Seattle PD case. To his surprise, there weren't any other files. Apparently, Swindler alone among the Seattle police wondered if there was a connection among Linda Healy and Donna Manson and Susan Rancourt and Kathy Parks and Brenda Ball and now George Ann Hawkins. Late in June of 1974, Swindler and investigators from 30 other regional police jurisdictions gathered in Olympia to discuss their cases. No consensus was reached on whether a pattern of murder was discernible throughout the Northwest nor was discussion limited to Healy, Manson, Rancourt, Parks, Ball, and Hawkins. The collected detectives brought dozens of unsolved open disappearance and murder cases to the meeting. The Seattle area alone listed 29. Sorting through them, a detective could find what he was looking for, a common thread, or no thread at all. <clears throat> Yet, the fact that such a meeting was called was reason enough for the Seattle Times and other papers to speculate on its significance. Stories linking some of the cases began to appear, all carrying the obligatory quote of skepticism from an official source. No one was yet ready to imagine the worst, not even reporters. Cops like Herb Swindler might harbor their private fears, but would not articulate them for a public airing. It would take another attack, a bold double abduction, to finally ignite the terror. A rare, utterly blue sky greeted the Seattleites as they rose on Sunday morning, July 14, 1974. The sun, so commonly a stranger, radiated a luxuriant warmth that loosened libidos and bathed the region in a welcome glow. The temperature climbed into the 80s by midday, tropical weather by Northwest standards. People lingered abed, dawdled over breakfast, skipped church, and forgot about washing the car. It was an ideal day to go to the beach. 
Swarms of sunbathers, swimmers, and picnickers, an estimated 40,000 people in all, converged on Lake Sammamish State Park, a popular recreation facility about 12 miles east of Seattle by way of US-90, the road to Ellensburg. That Sunday, Lake Sam, as it is known, was a riot to the census. There was a Seattle police picnic at one end. A local brewery was sponsoring its annual beer party, complete with music and sports contests, including a keg throwing competition. Water skiers zipped along the shoreline as toddlers gambled in the shallows. Frisbees whirred through the air. There was the pervasive smell of suntan oil, charcoal, and burnt hamburgers. For Janice Ann Ott, 23, July 14th began with a trip to the Suds Shot laundromat across the street from her house in Issaquah, about <clears throat> five miles east of Lake Sammamish. Striking with green eyes and reddish blonde hair that fell straight to just above her waist, Jan had been married since December of 1972 to Jim Ott, who in the summer of 1974 was living in Southern California. Jan was living with the roommate. Both husband and wife apparently required a lot of space. As she waited for her clothes to dry, Jan stuck up, I mean, struck up a conversation with Sud Shop owner David McKibben. She told him she was a probation officer and that she lived in Seattle until her residence was burglarized. That's why she explained she moved to Issaquah, the smaller, safer community in Janot's estimate. McKibben would also remember that Janot hadn't been wearing a bra that morning. They agreed to walk down the street for a cup of coffee. After coffee, McKibben headed home and Jan went back to her place to change into her black bikini. Over the swimsuit, she pulled on a pair of Levi cutoffs and a white blouse she knotted at her midriff. On her feet were blue and white deck shoes. Her husband, Jim, later told police that Jan was a punctual, compulsively organized person. True to her nature, that morning she left a note on her front door. I am at Lake Sammamish, son and myself, Jan Ott. Then she climbed aboard her yellow 10-speed and pedaled away. At noon, about the time that Jan Ott arrived at Lake Sam, Janice Graham, 22, married and a clerk typist at the Boeing Company, was standing near the park bandstand waiting to meet her husband and parents. A young man approached her. Miss Graham guessed he was 24 or 25 years old. He was wearing a white t-shirt with red trim at the neck, and if her memory served, he had on blue jeans. His left arm was in a sling, and he was holding it tightly against his body. He didn't offer her a name. He told the young woman he was waiting for some friends who were supposed to help him load his sailboat onto his car. Gesturing at his arm, he casually explained to her that he had injured it while playing racquetball. Exploiting this conversational opening, he asked Janice if she ever played the game. No? Well, you should try it. It's lots of fun. With his arm immobile and his friend's no-shows, the man wondered if Janice might help him with his boat. She was willing. He seemed harmless enough, and they began to walk toward the parking lot. This is out of sight, he exclaimed at one point. There are so many people. According to Mrs. Graham, her acquaintance had curly, quote, sandy blonde hair that he wore short on the sides and longer in the back. She estimated he was 5'8 or 5'10 and weighed 150 to 160 pounds. <clears throat> when they got to his car... Quote, a newish looking Volkswagen bug, metallic brown in color, end quote. She saw no boat and no trailer. Where is it? Janice Graham asked. Is that my folks' house just up the hill, he replied. Oh, she said, I really can't go with you. I have to meet my husband and folks. What time is it? He consulted his watch. It was 12.30, he told her. Janice was already five minutes late. She had to get going. That's okay, he said cheerfully. I should have told you it wasn't in the parking lot. Thanks for bothering. They walked back toward the park. He repeated his apologies and expressed his gratitude. He was very polite at all times, Mrs. Graham said in a later statement to police. Very sincere, easy to talk to. He was our friendly and he had a nice smile. Janice and the plate stranger parted company about halfway back to the bandstand. 
He continued forward toward the beach, and she turned to the concessionaria. Ten minutes later, as Janice Graham stood eating a snow cone in the shade of a concession stand, she saw the playfellow again. He was walking toward the parking lot once more. Beside him was a woman whom Graham couldn't see too well, but she remembered the woman had a yellow bike with her. It looked like a 10-speed. Janice had two thoughts at that moment. One, this guy was a pretty fast worker. Two, I wonder where he was going to put the bike. Down near the water's edge, Janot had found a good spot for Sun and herself. Sylvia Valent, 15, and her two high school girlfriends were stretched out next to Ott, not two feet away. Sylvia had watched the new arrival put down her knapsack, spread a white towel on the stand, peel off her cutoffs and blouse, and sit down. She produced an orange-colored jar and carefully applied cocoa butter from it to her skin. In a few moments, Valent saw a man approach Ott from the teenager's ground-level vantage. He looked to be 5'6 or 5'7, of medium build, and was darkly tanned. She described his hair as blondish brown. It came down to his neck, and he parted it on the side. He was clothed in white, white tennis shoes, white socks, white shorts, white t-shirt. His left arm was in a sling. According to Mrs. Valent, a cast extended from his wrist up past his elbow. Excuse me, she heard him say to Jen Ott. Can you help me put my sailboat onto my car? I can't do it myself because I broke my arm. To Sylvia Valancier, his voice carried, quote, a small English accent, kind of like a fag, end quote. Janice Ott looked up, she said, and eyed her visitor for a moment, then smiled. Well, sit down and let's talk about it. Where's the boat? He told her it was at his parents' house in Issaquah. Oh, really? She replied, I live in Issaquah. For the next 10 minutes, Janot and her new acquaintance chatted. Sylvia Valent could hear every word. The blonde on the towel, she told the cops, said she was Jan. The stranger introduced himself as Ted. Housewife Tracy Sharp, who was sitting with her five children, about five feet from Janot and Ted, later said she didn't think Ott was buying his line. The pretty blonde was somewhat curt, even caustic. Yet she eventually stood up, put on her cutoffs and blouse, and walked away with him. Witnesses remembered hearing Ted assure Jan how easy it was to learn to sail. She made him promise to introduce her to his parents. The witnesses provided a remarkably consistent portrait of a slim, smooth-talking stranger who could make the unlikeliest story sound plausible, or at least inviting. They differ on significant details of his height, hairstyle, and facial features, as if Ted were a chameleon capable of changing his appearance at will. But they all agreed on the two most significant facts, the approximate time that Ted arrived on the scene and that he carried his left arm in a sling. Imperfect as it is, human memory was to give the police their first solid leads in the case. Of course, by then it was too late for Jan Ott. But Ted wasn't finished for the day. At approximately the same time he was leading Jan Ott away to her death, 19-year-old Denise Marie Naslin was sitting with her boyfriend and another couple in a Seattle tavern. Denise was in a sour mood. She and her boyfriend, Kenny Little, 23, had been partying that weekend. Saturday night, they had been out quite late at a card game. <clears throat> Denise had... Wanted to stay even longer, but Kenny insisted they go home. <clears throat> then they received an early call from their friends, Nancy Batima and Bob Sargent, who invited them along to an outing at Talik Sam. Denise didn't want to go. She was tired and needed to prepare for a Monday exam in her computer programming class. She was serious about not wanting to be a secretary all her life. Kenny, however, wanted to go to Lake Sam, and Denise generally tried to please him. A few days before, she had asked Little his favorite color. He said blue, and Denise promptly changed her nail polish color to blue. An attractive, dark-eyed girl with long brown hair, Denise took great care with her appearance and was rewarded with the male attention she enjoyed. When she and Nancy went to bars together, Denise often sat at a table by herself so that men could notice her and ask her to dance. Usually that was as far as she went with them. She's not the type that talks a lot, Nancy Batima told police. She doesn't seem to be overly impressed by any guy, but 
She wouldn't go out of her way to talk to anybody, nor would she go out of her way to avoid anyone. Denise regularly used drugs. According to her friends, it was rare to find her without a supply of downers. On the way to Lake Sam in her tan Chevy, a gift from her mother, Eleanor Rose, Denise popped four or five milligram Valiums. Her companions each took a number of pills as well. At the park, she seemed to be enjoying herself. The four friends met some others they knew, mingled in the crowd a bit, had a snack at the concession stand, and drank beer from the big ice chest they'd brought along. They also passed around a joint. Meanwhile, Ted had returned. 16-year-old Cindy Seidenbaum's police report. Quote, approximately 4 p.m., a man who was walking toward me said, Excuse me, young lady, could you help me launch my sailboat? I then asked him what he had done to his arm. He stated that he had sprained it and he couldn't find anyone to help him. I told him I was sorry, but I couldn't help him because I had people waiting. I think his eyes were either green or blue, and he looked bug-eyed and set back. His pupils were real small. It appeared to me that he was nervous. He spoke rapidly and gestured with his hand. His left arm was in a sling. He was wearing a sort of bleached white boxer swimming suit with elastic for a waistband. His body had a full tan. He had a sort of a pointed nose and thin lips, end quote. Next, he approached 19-year-old Pat Turner, who had come to the park with her boyfriend, Nick Turner, with her boyfriend, Nick. Turner was on her way to the public restrooms at about 4.15 when he walked up to her with a story about the sailboat. She wasn't feeling well, too much sun, and told him she wasn't interested. The guy seemed friendly, though, she said. He was good-looking, but Turner acted as if she didn't understand him and then walked off, probably saving her life. By four, the temperature at Lake Sam had pushed into the 90s, and Denise Naslin grew languorous. She told Nancy she felt high and then dozed off in the sun in her fadedly cut-offs and dark blue halter top. Shortly, Kenny fell asleep, too. Nancy remembered that Denise awoke around about 4.20, and they chatted for a few minutes. Then suddenly Naslin rose and walked off toward the restrooms where still another witness would place her at about the same time. Kenny awoke a half hour later to discover Denise gone and he immediately sensed trouble. Her purse was in the trunk of the car and Denise went nowhere willingly without it. Kenny and Bob and Nancy began to search the park. Twilight approached and the crowds began to thin. Still no Denise. Darkness fell. They called for her, asked people if they'd seen her, nothing. At 8.30, they gave up. Kenny called the police who told him that a person must be on for 24 hours before he or she is even a candidate for a missing persons investigation. Besides, he was told a relative must initiate the report. When Kenny Little pulled up to Eleanor Rose's house that night in Denise's car, her mother ran outside in a panic. Little was barely able to get the story out before Mrs. Rose is back in the house. <clears throat> and on the telephone. And I'm going to pause there in chapter one um, on page 46 because I've been reading for almost an hour. And next time, pick up... Um, with uh, Eleanor Rose's police call. The Only Living Witness, the true story of serial sex killer Ted Bundy, written by Stephen J. Michaud and Hugh Ainsworth. Forward by former FBI profiler Roy Hazelwood. <laughs>